And um, at the end of the term, when they did the, the, the class evaluation things, the students thought that I didn't understand the material and that I was not prepared to teach. And so uh, I, I realized that although I thought I was showing off, it looked like I was being incompetent. And, uh, and so there, I, I got to tell my story that was sort of related, but not really related. And now we're definitely live on, uh, on YouTube and then that's getting recorded. Okay. Feed speed depth of cut, guessing, not recommended, carbide, explosion. You didn't know that in addition to being a, um, in addition to being an engineering professor, I'm also a poet, did you? Yeah, I was about to say, that's a nice haiku. It is, it, it, it is. I, um, I actually did a thing for a while where I, I would um, write a new haiku every morning and, and broadcast it live on, I think it was YouTube. Um, and uh, my, my purpose was because anybody can write a haiku, right? You just need 17 syllables. But what if you wanted to write a good haiku? You need the most important 17 syllables about your topic. Um, and, uh, and so what I would do is I would, uh, I would try to come up with a haiku that was about the thing I intended to focus on that day so that I could think of the most important 17 syllables about the thing that I intended to focus on that day. And it was my way to start the day. Um, and I thought I was going to get famous on, on YouTube and become a, a you know, a, a famous YouTuber and become an influencer and make millions of dollars on YouTube. It turns out that nobody cared that much about my haikus. I think I had seven followers or something. Um, so that wasn't a big thing for me, but who knows? Maybe my live M1800 lectures will get me to be a, a famous YouTube influencer. Feed speed, depth of cut. So, what do we what do we mean when we say feed speed depth of cut? I, I think I've said in previous lectures that those are the most important process variables in CNC machining. Feed speed depth of cut. Now we we know things like the time of day and how much sunlight comes through the window and which operator we choose to put at the machine tool and which machine tool and all those things. All those things are also process variables. But the ones that control the physics of the cutting operation are feed speed depth of cut. So let's make sure that we really understand what we mean when we talk about those things. So what is the feed in um, the machine? How quickly the whole tool bit is moving horizontally? So if we have a milling this. operation, so if we've got a milling operation, here's the, uh, here's sort of a, cross section view of our spindle. And then we've got a little tool holder going on here. And then there's a tool coming out of it. And then we've got a workpiece down here. And so our tool is gonna come down and go across and cut through the workpiece in order to remove material. And so what you said, the, and what you said the feed is, I think is the, um, is the rate of motion while it's moving either in the down direction or in the sideways direction, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, or, or Z and X axis. Or yeah, Z so here, y, here I guess we're really showing the, the Z axis. So Z is here, X is here why would then be in and out of the board in this in this drawing right so the feed rate is the relative motion between the cutting tool and the workpiece or the feed is the relative motion between the cutting tool and the workpiece 
in the XYZ Cartesian coordinate system that we use to represent the machine tool. What are the units for feed rate? Inches per minute. Right, if we're Americans or American, then it's inches per minute. Uh, anybody know what it is if we're anywhere else in the world? Millimeters per minute or millimeters? It would be per millimeters per minute. Per, per flute as well? Or? Do, all right, so millimeters per minute or inches per minute. So that is a possible unit. If somebody said, or it could be inches per flute or in or millimeters per flute. So the flutes are the cutting edges on the tool. If we look at the bottom of the tool, so now we're now it's as if we are the person laying on top of the sacrificial workpiece. So we're we're laying on the altar of the workpiece. We got our eyes here and we're looking up. So if we look at the bottom of the tool. we might see three cutting edges. And as we look at those three cutting edges, the, there's cutting edges that spiral up the tool from all of those three. We call these the flutes. F-L-U-T-E, right? So this, that's a three flute cutter. This would represent a four flute cutter, five, six, seven, eight. You could have many, many flutes on a, on a milling cutter, but the ones that we tend to use in the lab are three or four. Um, and that's just because that's the ones we tend to buy. <clears throat> Each flute represents a cutting edge. So if we did inches, per flute, and we'll say inches per flute, inches per tooth um, interchangeably. If we said inches per flute, how many flutes interact with the tool per revolution? Three in this case. So here we've got three flutes. So there's three flutes per revolution. inches per flute, three flutes per revolution. So if we know the feed is 0 0.003 inches per flute, and we wanna know what the feed is in inches per minute, what do we have to do? And yes, if I was the one answering the question and I was the student in the class, my answer right now, and if you're like me, this is what you're thinking, we have to do math. Google. Uh, you could use Google. You could open up your CAM software and you could type the numbers in and they would tell you the answers. But what's the math we have to do in order to get from 003 inches per flute to inches per minute if we wanna know what the inches per minute are? So uh, we'd have to do unit conversion. So we'd have to do flute per revolution. So we got flutes per revolution. We could multiply by inches per FL flute. And that would give us inches per revolution. Then what else do we need to know? Revolutions per minute. Is that times rev per minute? Yeah, and then the revs go away and we get inches per minute. So what's the common vernacular for revolutions per minute? RPM. RPM. Sometimes people get hung up because they forget that RPM 
is not a thing. It's revolutions per minute. Okay, so what does RPM define? Spindle speed. Speed equals RPM. This is spindle. Spindle speed, we can talk about it as RPM. What are the other units we might use if we want to describe spindle speed? Don't want to erase that part yet. So next week, we're going to focus SFM. Now, like RPM, SFM actually means something, and it's feet per minute. On the surface? Right, it's feet per minute, but feet of what? It's how many feet per minute the cutting edge of the tool, so if this is the tool, it is moving through the workpiece. As the tool moves through the workpiece in, well, the workpiece is moving this way, right? The tool is moving this way. They have relative velocity. The, the, the two vector arrows have got to be the same if it's velocity and there's no acceleration. No, no, the two vector arrows have to be the same instantaneously, whether there's acceleration or not. So let's look at the tool's velocity moving this way through the workpiece. So it's the velocity of the cutting edge moving through the workpiece. Now, in the case where we have a rotating end mill, Let's, let's look at the bottom here for a second. In the case where we have a rotating end mill, when we're talking about SFM, we're going to ignore the other two flutes for now. What we care about is this cutting edge as it's moving through the workpiece. So here's the center of the tool, right? It's moving through the workpiece. So there's I guess my hand or the board, let's say the board represents the workpiece and the cutting tool is moving through the workpiece. What's the velocity? So the tool's rotating, right? Right, it's got a, it's got a spindle speed. The tool's attached to the spindle rigidly. Tools rotating like this, spinning around with some RPM. If the board is the workpiece and the tool's rotating, what's the velocity of the cutting edge? The torque? No. It's, it's the speed that the edge of the cutting piece is moving, right? It's the speed that the edge of the cutting tool is moving relative to the flat whiteboard here. So if this is my cutting edge, the speed changes from here to here, right? If I'm at the center of the tool, what is the Cartesian, what's the velocity, the scalar vector, uh, the scalar of the vector velocity at the center of the cutting tool as the tool spins. Ignore for the fact that it might be feeding. Just consider the fact that it's spinning. At the center? At the center of the tool, what's the, what's the velocity? Zero, right? Zero. What's the center at the outside edge of the tool? Or what's the center? What's the velocity at the outside edge of the tool? More than zero. 
It's absolutely more than zero. Has anybody ever gone tubing? Yes. So have you ever calculated the velocity or speed? We, we tend to call it speed when we're flying off the tube and skipping across the water, right? Has anybody ever calculated the speed of the tube at the outside edge of the radius of the, the curve that it's making when you can no longer hold on to the handles and you fly off and skip across the water? I probably did that in yeah, physics. Yeah, we did that in physics. Well, don't know it off the top of my head. I remember doing it standing on the back of the boat watching the guys fall off. Well, you're um, trying to hold on. You don't have time to do math, right? But um, we figured out that with the, the length of the rope that we were using and the speed of the boat that we were pulling the tube with, that people usually couldn't hold on after about 90 miles an hour. But everybody was gone at 120 miles an hour. So... It pays to have a powerful tow boat, but um, and oh, when it sixty miles an hour, you skip about four times before you go back into the water when you're sliding across the water. Um, so, what it, what's the equation that determines the uh, the speed of the outside edge of the rotating cutting tool? The radius sorry, the, uh, times RPM. The service speed. Say again? The radius times the RPM. Radius. Times pi. Times pi. So pi r. Uh, and a two. We, what's, somebody, said, somebody said something correct. A two. We need a two. Where should I put the two? Pi squared? No. No, two no. pi. Two pi. How about two r? Makes more sense if I say 2R to me. So what is this equation right now as we've got it? Area of the circle. The circumference. That's the circumference. If we squared the radius, it would have been the area. But since we multiplied by the radius by two, so the circumference is the distance per revolution, right? Each revolution, we go one circumference around the circle. So I, I actually, I, instead of 2R, I like to say diameter. Because when we talk about end mills, we talk about the diameter of the end mill. When we talk about turned parts, we talk about the diameter of the turned part. So instead of 2R, is it OK if I say D? I'm going to yes. take that as a yes. Um, so pi times diameter is. And what are the units for pi times diameter? It's um, inches. So we typically talk about how many inches the, the tool is, right? So this would may, maybe be a 0.5 inch end mill. So pi times diameter is typically inches per revolution, right? So if we're at the outside edge of the tool, our inches per revolution are pi times diameter, but our surface speed, and I know why it's feet over minute instead of inches over minutes. Do you guys know why? Because you have more than one cutting edge? Mm -mm. No, we only care about one cutting edge at a time when we do speed. Is it because it would be a really big number? It's because if we used inches, it would be a bigger number. And so in we, when we use our metric units, we use meters. Instead of feet per minute. Uh, and it's just so that we've got a smaller number that's easier for us to deal with inside our head. Because some people get freaked out with giant numbers inside their head. Um, but how do we convert from feet to inches? Divide by 12. Is it divide or multiply? 
is going to be multiplying. I never remember. I always just write down the units and say, I got 12 inches per feet. And if I multiply those two, I'm going to get inches squared per feet revolutions. That doesn't help me at all. But if I do one over 12 inches per feet, then this one flips over, right? So I can do divide by 12. And I end up where, so, so 12 inches per feet. And when I do this, I can go like this. And then this one ends up on top and I end up with feet per revolution. So we're getting closer, right? Service feet per minute. Now I got feet per revolution. Do I know how to go to um, feet per minute now? Is it just multiply by RPM? Yeah. So, um, and I'll, I'll actually, Oh, no, in your reading, right? In your lab reading for this week, all these equations are there, right? Lab reading, lab exercise. Yes. All those equations are there, right? And, and we give you some rule of thumb equations, too. Uh, let me see. There's one of them that has a four in it. Somebody get that open right now? So I don't have to go over to my computer and look. Do we have the equation that has a four in it? All right, I'll pull it up. I don't have, I only have one monitor today, so. In lab yesterday? Uh, yeah, in the lab reading from feed speed depth of cut. Let me see if I can click the link here. Chapter two, feet speed, depth of cut. Talk about oh, that was V, the cutting edges was four. So it's uh, SPM so equals RPM times Z times SPT. Yeah. Maybe I didn't, oh, I, I must have deleted that slide. All right, sometimes. Yeah, no, never mind. I, I actually I took that slide out. If you Google uh, convert from RPM to SFM, or if you Google, um, yeah, if you could Google convert from RPM to SFM, we've got 12 inches per feet, right? And we've got diam uh, so circumference is what is it again? Diameter times pi. Correct. So this is inches per revolution. And so if I divide this. I get revolutions per foot. So it must be that I want to, all right. So if it's, I'm, oh, I should have had this all thought out in advance. So I can go from RPM to SFM, right? Or I could go from SFM to RPM. To do this, I need to know the diameter, right? If I know the diameter, I can go, I can go from RPM to SFM or I can go from SFM to RPM. When I'm going from SFM to RPM, I have feet and I want revolutions and I have to divide 12 by pi, 12 divided by pi equals four for a very special case, right? 
What's the special case where 12 divided by pi equals four? Where pi is three. When pi equals three, right? Pi equals three when we have one significant figure, right? So if we're moving from RPM to SFM, we can use that 12 divided by pi equals four to quickly do the math in our head when we want to sort of know what the correct answer is. Um, and, and there's books, this book. I guarantee you that that equation is in this book. I never bother to do that. One, I always have a calculator. Two, I never am certain that I remember the equation correctly off the top of my head unless it's F equals MA. Pretty sure I remember that one the same way every time. Or E equals MC squared, which I've never actually used except to try to pretend that I sounded smart. All right, that's not quite true. Um, I did take the, the physics class where you had to manipulate equations and stuff way back when. What is that, physics four or three? Where's, which, which physics class do you guys talk about relativity? Three. Three? Physics three. So, so I may have used E equals MC squared in more than just trying to sound smart in physics three doing my homework. But that, honestly, when you're doing your homework, you're just trying to sound smart enough to get a good grade, right? So I've never used that equation except when trying to sound smart. Um, and I'm pretty sure that anybody that uses that equation to try to sound smart doesn't sound smart. All right, so I never remember equations. You may, if you're good at memorizing equations and having them be correct off the top of your head every time, you may choose to simply memorize equations. I figure them out based on the units, every time I need to use them, all I need to do is know that there is an equation that solves my problem. All right, so what time is it? I can't see, I don't have a clock in this 11 room. 11.30. 11.30, perfect, good timing. I have another haiku for you, and then we'll move on to why this lecture is important. Engineering's math, just a bunch of word problems, Cancel the units. Okay, that's my uh, next haiku. Oh. I'm going to put a quiz question this week. I'm going to publish the quiz still so I can add one more question. I'm going to put a quiz question this week. I want you to write a haiku about something you learned this week. All right. So... Why do we care about the, um, so I said feed speed depth of cut. And I would say that feed speed, you wanna come? You wanna help me lecture? Here, look, look cute on the camera and all my students will be happy that there was cuteness on the camera. Okay, now get out of here. Is it time for lunch? Oh. Okay, well, fix yourself some lunch. Bye. Bye. Hello. <laughs> She's gone. <clears throat> All right, feed speed depth of cut. These are the four most important PVs in machining. Isn't that three? Why is it four? Radial and axial. Because or... depth of cut oh, yeah. in milling has two dimensions, right? If we've got, oh, let's see if I can draw this. I've got my workpiece. 
you'll see why I'm an engineer, not an artist. And then I want to go like this. Right. And if I've got my my milling tool and I've just finished this pass right here, this has two dimensions. One of them is radial and one of them is axial. I never remember which one it is. So I go back and I look at the picture. Uh, radial is how much of the radius is engaged. That kind of makes sense. So it's how far into the part we stepped. Axial is how far down into the part we stepped. So this, so you could, you could consider this to be like an area, right? So that radial times the axial equals an area. Is that true? Can you still hear me? Of course. Yes. So radial depth times axial depth equals an area. If we have a feed rate that we multiply that by, what units should we use? For our feed rate? I'm gonna use inches per minute. Okay. Because these two have inches, you guys can see the bottom of them, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can see what I'm writing. So I get inches times inches times inches per minute. So this is speed. Right? What does that equal? Cubic inches per minute. It okay. equals the material removal rate in inches cubed per minute. Did I mention the material removal rate yesterday in lecture? Yes. Yeah, I think totally so. Material removal rate is important for several reasons. Material removal rate is important, one, because of economics. And economics can mean a lot of things. In fact, I think if I ever, dis oh, this is tough. I've been reading a lot of stuff by this guy, David Sinclair, who teaches genetics at Harvard. And I really think it would be cool to go be a postdoc or a doctoral student in his lab because he thinks that he can find a medical way to allow people to live for hundreds of years using genetic therapy and stuff like that. And I think it would be really cool to work on his research. But until I discovered David Sinclair, if I was to get another PhD, it would be a PhD in economics. Economists sometimes study the economy. But what they really study is decision making and impact of outside forces on how decisions are made and on the results of things. Economists get to study whatever the heck they want to. Whereas when you have a PhD in manufacturing engineering, people kind of expect you to study manufacturing engineering. Um, anyway, so the economy of material or of many of the world depends on material removal rate because CNC machining is still one of the most prolific manufacturing processes in the world. And we couldn't have our society without manufacturing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the speed at which we can remove material greatly impacts our standard of living 
in the United States today, whether or not we're the people removing the material. Does that make sense? Would anybody yes. like to dispute it? Because we can talk about it. Okay. All right. So if you guys are willing to accept the material removal rate is important for that reason. Why else do you think material removal rate might be important? It's certainly important for that reason. Because like if you remove weight at certain at a certain speed, you're gonna have it. So you're yeah, you're removing a lot of material, but you're wearing out your tool faster than need be. Okay, so speed cutting speed especially so the uh, surface speed or rpm doesn't matter which one you which units you use the faster you move the tool the faster the tool wears out so that's certainly a factor and it ties back into the economics and we're going to actually have a lecture where we go through and we model that and we try to see what part of the process can we optimize to get the optimal cutting speed because there is an optimal cutting speed for each operation <clears throat> There's a deeper reason why material removal rate is really important in CNC machining. Waste is it efficiency, energy? like how accurate it is? So the, all, all of that stuff ties back into the economics, and it's, it's important. But let's think about, so, so one, of the, one of the people we talked about um, manufacturing, one of the earlier lectures, talked about power. And when we talked about, so being efficient in the sense of power in that earlier lecture, we were tying it back to the idea of economics, right? So power costs money. Power is limited. So if we use more power for our manufacturing process, there's less power available for other things because the way we get our power to do things like manufacturing in the United States is pretty much burn coal. <laughs> my father is a civil engineer went to wpi and uh and he used to work for for a company that built power plants and uh, and i remember being with him one of his last jobs and we were standing up on top of the turbine building of the power plant that they had just finished building or the, the second unit of the power plant that they had just finished building and uh, and we were looking at the ethanol plant across the street this was in the middle of corn country in nebraska and uh, the ethanol plant across the street, my father's company had also built. And the process, the ethanol to make is an additive to our gasoline to make our gasoline less, ef well, yeah, to make our gasoline less efficient. So there's less power in our gasoline after it has ethanol added to it. They subsidized the farmers to grow the corn to send the corn to the ethanol plant. And my father was telling me that the ethanol plant comes to the power plant to get their coal because they don't have a pulverizer. The coal gets delivered to the power plant on railroad cars, gets pulverized. The ethanol plant comes, picks up some of it to run their boiler, to make the ethanol, to make the gasoline less efficient. So anyway, irony. So, so that's the power economics. What are the units for power? Joules. Kilowatt. Kilowatt. Or watts. What's a watt? One joule per second. Is a joule per second. What's a joule? A uh, unit of energy. Yeah, yeah, it's a unit of energy, but you could you could call it something else. You could is it a kilogram meters 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 squared? Second squared. Somebody somebody said it. Say it again. Kilogram kilogram meters times meters squared over second squared. squared. Kilograms meters squared per second squared. Yeah, correct. That's a joule. Is kilogram meter squared per second squared? Is that yeah. true? Okay. Like I said, I'm not good at memorizing these things. What I want to know if I have the correct answer, I use a reference book. 
which is why there's reference books on my shelf. Um, all right. So if this is a joule, then what's a watt equal? Kilograms meter second per sec per uh, meter squared per second cubed. So kilograms. What if we did meter? Oh, this would be watt now, right? All right. So, all right. So, joules per second. All right. So, kilograms times meters squared per second. Is that now cubed? Is that true? Somebody tell me if I did the math right. Yes. Okay, good. Um, all right. Now, if I take So here, let me write it again. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Yep. What's this? Velocity. What's this? Force. Your power. Power equals force, fours, force times velocity. What's the velocity that we're talking about here? If the power equals force times velocity and we're concerned with cutting. Can you read the question, please? So if power equals force times velocity, and we've got our cutting tool moving through the workpiece material at our feed rate and rotating with our speed, the power that it takes to make the cut, the power of the cut equals force times velocity, right? Because power always equals force times velocity. If we're looking at our cutting operation, What's the velocity that's important? Speed. SS, SFM. It's the surface speed that gives you the highest vector quantity for the speed of the cutting edge moving through the workpiece material. So when, it, when you're at that point in the rotation, the feed adds to it a little bit. When you're at that point in the rotation, the feed subtracts from it a little bit, right? But let's talk about surface speed. So a uh, typical RPM might be 10,000 RPM. And let's say we have a one inch end mill. At 10,000 RPM, What's the surface speed at the outer edge of a one inch end mill? Now we know at the center of it, it's zero, but what is it at the outer edge? Pi times diameter, right? That is three, let's call it three. 
and that's inches per revolution times 10,000. So that's 30,000. And that is in inches, right? So this is 10,000 rev per minute. So that's inches per minute. We want feet per minute. So how many feet per minute is 30,000 inches per minute? I gotta be doing something wrong here. Pi times diameter, so three times one is three, times 10,000 is 30,000. 2,500. 12 would be 2,500. So 2,500 feet per minute. Um, the typical feed rate for an operation like this might be 15. So the 2,500 is significantly greater than the 15. And usually when we're talking about the power calculation, Oh, and sometimes the 15 is added to it, and sometimes the 15 is subtract from it, depending on where you are in the rotation, right? So we typically ignore the 15 and just look at the 2,500. So the velocity that we are concerned about in understanding how much power it takes to make the cut comes from the surface speed. What's the force? And I don't have a clock or a watch, so somebody tell me if we're running out of time. Well, we just ran out of time. So before we, uh, Dear WPI Community Working Group, COVID-19 vaccine eligibility. I think I'm gonna have to read that form, that email. Um, so it's time to end, but what's the force? What's the force that we're talking about? So force has to be between two objects, right? Otherwise there's no force. So what are the two objects? If the power of the cut equals force times velocity, the velocity is the cutting speed. This is the power to cut. What's the force? Is it between the material and the spindle? It's, yes, like the it is between the material the and the spindle, but it's the cutting tool that transmits the force between the spindle and the, and the um, workpiece material, right? So if this is my, sorry, I lost that one. That one fell out of the spindle. If this is my cutting tool, the force is applied at the interaction of the cutting edge with the workpiece material. What happens when the force is too high? The tool breaks. Can it result in like extra It goes heat? kaboom. The breaks. Extra the tool heat. breaks, usually with an explosive sound, or the spindle stops spinning. If the tool is strong enough and the force is too high, it overpowers the spindle motor and the spindle motor stalls and stops spinning. Both That's the tool breaking and the spindle stopping to spin are bad things. So one of the things we're gonna do next week is we're going to learn how to model the forces and the power consumption in these machining operations so that we can plan our operations without too much feed speed and depth of cut so that we don't end up with a carbide explosion or a stalled spindle. And so that's the end for today. I will uh, go ahead and stay online if people have questions. Um, but thank you guys for being here. So can you calculate the RPM for when an explosion would take place? If you know how strong the tool is, 
you can determine when an explosion would take place. Um, it's much easier to determine when the spindle is going to stall because the, uh, the strength of the tool is going to depend on the bulk material properties of the tool, the geometry of the tool, and those things. So usually, before we get a good model for a particular tool and when it's going to explode, we have to explode some tools and note at which force they exploded. That's the easiest way to do that. Um, and we don't do that. Well, actually, it's not quite true. We sometimes in the lab have done tool testing for tooling manufacturers, but it's the tooling manufacturer that figures that stuff out before they sell you the tools so that they can tell you at what speeds and feeds and depths of cut to operate the tools so that you keep buying their tools because if every time you use a tool that explodes, you won't keep buying that tool. So, um, so the tooling manufacturers do a lot of research in this area to understand how their tool is gonna perform in different um, things. Now, these um, all kinds of different things that impact this power um, and, or ultimately the force, but the, the workpiece material that you're cutting impacts it. The, uh, the friction between the tool material and the workpiece material impacts it. The sharpness of the tool impacts it. The material removal rate, of course, and actually the, um, the feed rate does have some impact that they've calculated in with their models. And we're gonna go through all that stuff next week. Uh, let me go ahead, switch back to Zoom here. I'm gonna uh, stop the live.